He was the founder of extreme programming, and he rediscovered TDD. Now, he gained a very large following. His practices and disciplines that he preached and taught uh, gained the respect of Robert Martin, Martin Fowler, Ward Cunningham, many in the community. And the results of XP were quite significant, were a significant improvement over what we were experiencing with waterfall development. But XP wasn't the only framework and it wasn't the only way. Scrum in the 1990s was founded by Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber. We had Mike Beadle who combined Scrum and XP together. We had Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas who were very much focused on the individual developer and the behaviors and characteristics of craftsmen. And there were others too, with other types of approaches that were proving to be more effective. And to round out the group of 17, and I think some of you know where this is going, we had a couple of consultants that joined the party. And in 2001, at a summit snowbird called the Lightweight Process Summit, they all came together to try to figure out what they had all independently been experimenting with and discovering was working. And that's where the Agile Manifesto was born. They realized that the things that were in common between all these different approaches, individuals and interactions over the processes and tools, emphasis on working software, customer collaboration, responding to change over following a plan, these were in common. And after the summit, they corresponded through email and landed on 12 principles to give us more specific details on how to actually do this. What are the principles that guide this new way of working, this new way of developing software? And here we are 20 years later, and despite all the success of Agile, there are some pretty big warning signs out there. And they're coming right from the people who founded the movement. They're coming from folks like Dave Thomas, who has a very uh, entertaining talk called Agile is Dead. The founder of Agile, or one of the signatures, is saying Agile is dead. Robert Martin puts it this way, saying, it seems like you're saying that agile, that the agile movement isn't agile. To which he says, it's not. It gave that up long ago. Martin Fowler, a little bit more diplomatically, puts it that the folks from the early days in the 1990s that actually found this, they don't recognize what we're doing today. It's not what they really had envisioned. And Kent Beck, the individual who I personally believe deserves most of the credit for the movement itself, put it simply, we're right back to where we were 20 years ago. There's tons more of examples like this. Talk to anyone about their personal opinions about Agile or their experiences with it, and you will almost get an emotional reaction. It won't be positive most of the time. It will be about something that went wrong and they were hurt, or it will be about how they don't think it's effective in this situation or in, these, in this type of work, or just plain outright resentment and just you know, don't, don't let Agile touch me. The love and excitement of the 1990s and the excitement that the community had around discovering new ways of building software is gone. And it's because we've lost our way. So to help 
show how we've lost our way. I want to share some videos. This is a fictitious story, but it is very real in this scenario because this is things that we have all experienced. So let me share. Hey, Michael, is there supposed to be sound? Hey, Mike, how's things in IT? Have any good engineers left? Uh, Jack, how are you? Very, very funny. Yeah, we've kept most of the good ones. We had to let the others go, though, due to the budget cuts. How are sales going? Terrible, but we think we have a way out of this mess. We have an idea. Oh, what's that? Well, we want to create a website where employees for a company can come pick a virtual supply room and have the office supplies shipped directly to their home. The idea is raw, but we believe organizations will go for it. It eliminates the reimbursement process for office supplies they've been struggling with since the pandemic and also allows us to utilize our latest innovations to help companies identify abnormal consumption and limit abuse. Mm, interesting. I, I like it. Well, here's the deal. I talked with Tim. Oh, our CEO? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, Tim is super excited about this. He really wants, you know, real pilot data on this in five months and then ready for a demo at our annual shareholder meeting in six months with early pilot data to share. Whoa, that's aggressive. I mean, something like this normally takes like a year to pull off, don't you think? Five months is really going to be hard, if, if not impossible. Yeah, but here's the deal, and I can have Tim explain this as well, is we've got to have the shareholders something to believe in. If we don't, the company's done for. We just need to find a way to make it work. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, we can give this a shot, but wow, this is, this is going to be really tough. Look, look, come up with a plan. You'll have whatever you need. We need this to work. So I want to reintroduce to us the original problem that we attempted to solve with Waterfall that Agile solved. The problem Agile solved was, is, and always will be how to effectively build and deliver software with a small team, a specific goal, and a fixed date. The economics of business dictate fixed dates, limited budgets, need for on time and on budget execution. The physics of software development though, create complexity, unknown unknowns, volatility, risk, and high cognitive demands. How do we get these two things to work together? The problem was not how to scale your teams how to flatten your organization's reporting structure, how to change mindsets, how to build an agile company. These can be great things, but they aren't part of the problem agile solved. They are additional constructs, which we have found helpful. So in our list of the three ways in which we have lost our way, number three on this list is, we have forgotten the original problem that Agile solved. To understand the other two, let's continue our journey 
But let's look at how this story plays out in Waterfall. Jack, uh, I've got a plan. Awesome. Let's hear it. Well, there are four, four parts to developing software. There's the analysis, and then the design, and then the development, and then the QA. And since the date is fixed, and it's hard to guess exactly how long each step will take, we will just say like one month for each of the steps. So you're saying we'll be done in four months? I thought this was going to take a year. Well, um, it doesn't sound like the dates can shift. So we'll know more as I work with each of the team members to define the tasks and their timing. Um, I may need your help to make sure this becomes a priority for everyone. And we'll just encourage them to work as hard as they can to get it done. I can't guarantee it will work, but it gives us the best shot. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. I'll let Tim know. Okay. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Oh, hey, Jack. Uh, it's going great. We just wrapped up our analysis phase. And, uh, you know, the milestones that we had set originally, we got all those accomplished. And so we're just pushing forward into design. And the analysis shows that there's quite a few features needed, but they should be doable. We didn't see anything that was, you know, um, over the top. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you're on schedule then. I, I said I knew you could do it. Tell the team thanks. All their hard work over time. Can't say enough how much this means to everybody and the company. Sounds good. I'll let them know. Mike, how's it going? Hey, how are you, Jack? It's going great. We just uh, finished our design phase. We had a few interesting questions come up about security requirements, but I think we got those sorted out after talking with your team. Perfect. Hey, hey, when can we actually take a look at this thing? Is there anything that we can see? Oh, uh, yeah, not, no, not, not yet. I mean, we're still a few weeks out from uh, being able to show something. The team hasn't even written any code yet. Mm. Uh, it's getting a little nervous. We only have three months till our pilot. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, don't, don't worry. Everything is, gonna, is going to according to plan. Oh, hey, Jack. Uh, well, we've hit our first hiccup. Oh? Uh, yeah, do you remember that security thing I was telling you about last month? Well, our developers pointed out that we need to build a full client registration process to make it work. It's going to add at least three weeks to the timeline. But the good news is, is that we had a month cushion, so we should still be okay. Um, I kind of figured this would happen at some point. Usually during development or testing is when these things start to go off track. Yeah, but I mean, everybody understands the dates, very important, it's critical that we hit, you know, so, so you're still feeling good, right? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're gonna be okay. It's gonna be close, but it should, should come together. Jack, how are you? Hey, doing all right, Mike. Just catching me coming back from the links today. What's going oh, on? Fun. Well, I've got some bad news for you. Oh, well, now what? Well, the engineers spent six weeks getting the registration process put together. They started the main portal and still haven't dealt with any of the shipping or inventory system integrations. So those in integrations are critical. What, what's, um, what's happening? Well, uh, I don't want you to worry. I, I took care of it. They said they needed to do it right the first time, and we're dealing with all kinds of crazy edge cases with the registration process, handling things such as people who have multiple or no middle names. Uh, they were out spending time trying to create this fancy reusable library, which from what I can tell, just got themselves stuck in spinning for a week with no actual results. Um, they added a user rename feature, so if someone gets married, divorced, or someone spells their name wrong, it could be corrected. Just spent about two weeks doing extras. <sighs> two weeks on extras? I, Mike, I think you've got to get a hold of your people. This is a business. This isn't some project that we're just doing, you know, for a grade. I, you know, we, we need to get things done. Uh, I, I don't care how fancy their stuff is. We really need to, to take, take control of this. Um, I mean, we'll take back all those fancy things we got. You know, we got computers. Uh, you know, they wanted a ping pong table. We got that. You know, we're going to sell these things at auction. 
Yeah, I, I hear you. And I've already addressed it. I told them that they really need to get it done. We don't have time for playing around like this. We have a critical schedule to keep. All right, good. I mean, let me know if I need to get Tim to step in. Um, you know, how are we planning on making up the time? Um, well, our only option at this point is to basically cut two weeks from our testing cycle. Um, that's all we really have left to cut. So, so we're just going to be bug ridden. Well, we'll see. I mean, we do have some pretty good developers, but honestly, there's nothing else that can get cut and still make the date. You know, your team kind of came back and they told us that they really needed all of these features for this product to be successful. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say so. Um, well, actually about that, um, I'd like to talk to you if you have a second about a minor change. Oh, no. Dude, we can't take any additional changes on at this point. Uh, there, there's no way. Yeah, but if we don't have an approval step to the order before it ships to our customers, they won't buy it uh, because they're afraid. I mean, they're going to be getting office supplies too easy, limited oversight, even if we have fancy machine learning doing its thing. Well, why, why didn't you see this coming before? Where was your market research on this? Well, we just didn't think about it. Oh, well, that's not good, Jack. I mean, last minute changes to an already behind project can cause a huge impact with so many moving parts. I mean, we've got all kinds of pieces being developed across this, this new product. Well, I guess you're right. Uh, what's, what's the approval step gonna cost us? I, I honestly don't know, but does it really even matter? We've got to ship this thing, right? Right. Mike, how's it going? Five months in. Uh, oh. When do you think we're going to be in pilot? Hi, Jack. I was expecting your call. Uh, well, we've got too many bugs. It's going to be at least another two weeks. That's only going to give us two weeks of data before the shareholder meeting. I know, but there's really nothing I can do. The there's nothing to pilot until we get most of these bugs worked out. And by the way, we cannot even come close to getting the inventory and shipping systems integrated. I told them just write out the orders to a text file. We will have someone manually adjust the inventory and create the shipping records. Um, I already talked with operations and they were good with that for the short term, as long as the order volume was low. Yeah, I mean, that's just great, but Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the best we can do for right now. Well, Tim wanted to have Big Soda to be our pilot customer. What? Big Soda? They have like 10,000 plus employees. No way. My team tells me this thing for the pilot should have no more than five users at any one time because they didn't have a chance to tune the database or do anything else to make it perform. Testers are also pointing out that all kinds of problems with the registration process. So the chances are that at least one of the 10,000 users will click a wrong button and break the whole thing. We can stick with Big Soda, but maybe we can just select five users from the group and maybe beta, like beta test and get away with that. Will Tim be okay with that? I think so. Honestly, I think he's planning to use PowerPoint for most of the shareholder meeting as he doesn't have much faith in IT. No offense, but this is kind of typical. PowerPoint, wow. Well, look, it's not my fault. This is just hard stuff. I mean, I told you at the beginning that this would take about a year to do right, and we're doing the best that we can. Hey, Mike. Well, we've got some preliminary data from the three users that were able to register and place an order. Oh, and? It's bad. They logged in clicked around on a few pages and each ordered a box of pens, nothing else. It's like they were just mocking us. Uh, it's like $3 orders. Oh no, so what's the plan? Well, Tim is gonna try and save the company with the PowerPoint slides, but I just don't think it's gonna be enough. I'll let you know how the shareholder meeting goes, but definitely expect at minimum another round of budget cuts. Oh, sheesh. Okay. Well, we did the best we could. I wish there was another way.
All right. Thankfully, there is another way, which many of us know. Waterfall fails miserably uh, because it's a predictive model. Its success is all predicated on very early planning and discovery uh, through planning. Uh, when bumps in the road are hit, the only thing left to really cut is quality because often those bumps are usually hit when the rubber meets the road, when that's in the development phase or in the testing phase. Now, to understand how Agile changes this and to discover the second way that we have lost our way, I'm going to share the next video. Hey, Jack, how are you? All right. Good. I've got a plan. Oh, great. Let's hear it. Well, we're going to build a list with all of the features needed for this project. And then we're going to put this list in an order based on the value and effort that will be required to build that feature. It's going to take everyone's input, even Tim's, to get that list created and prioritized. And then uh, we're going to do a few other things just to get the team up to speed and dialed into the effort and then go. And we start building the product in order to, uh, in order to, uh, based, based on the backlog that was just prepared. Oh, great. How, how long is that going to take? I'm thinking about one day. You're going to figure it all out in one day? Well, no, not, not everything. This will be a high level understanding of the backlog and nothing more. Um, the actual details we're going to be figuring out as we go. We'll need your team's help, though, to answer questions and to share ideas as we start specific uh, features. Sure, no problem. Like I said, this is top priority for the company, according to Tim. So shouldn't have any trouble pulling people together to help answer questions. What kind of summary or ending product activities uh, are you planning? Uh, what, what end? Well, we need to be in, five, uh, in pilot in five months and finished in six. Oh, um, right. Okay, well, um, so what we're thinking of doing is we want to use just lots of opportunities to do frequent inspections and then make adjustments as we go. What, what am I missing? Well, what about final testing? What about validation? How much time are you going to need for that part? Oh, I, I understand what you're trying to say. Um, well, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be changing our quality processes completely, and we're going to be integrating quality into our development as we work so that quality won't have to happen, at, or a quality testing cycle won't have to happen at the end. Oh, uh, well, great. That sounds like you've got it together. Um, why don't we go ahead and organize that project in a day or two and then go? Okay, yeah, pretty simple. And I think it will work out really well for us. It will help give visibility on the things we need to adjust to achieve our goal. Uh, hey, Jack, we've got a problem and I need your help to solve it. Problems already? I, I, I thought you said this approach would work. Oh, it is. Um, it's helped us to see the problem through data. So now we have the opportunity to fix it before it kills the project. What kills the project? Well, based on the first three week sprints, we now have the data that clearly shows we'll miss the date. We need to cut scope and cut now. Well, that, that's, that's no, that's just not acceptable. We've got to find a way to make this work. Let, let me bring this up to Tim. Maybe we can talk this over with him tomorrow. Uh, maybe he can give you a larger budget or something. We need to find a way to make this work. Okay, sounds great. I look forward to talking to him. Oh, hey, Tim. Jack tells me uh, you can't get the job done. Uh, what's, uh, what's going on with that? Oh, we can, but we just need to, to uh, cut some scope so that we can be real about what's actually possible. Look, I can give you whatever money you need. Just double your development staff. Oh, I, I wish it were that simple. Um, the problem is it takes about a month from the time we decide to hire new people that they're actually here and be, you know, hands-on keyboard. And then it takes about another two months for them to get up to speed on what we're doing. And during that time, they're actually slowing down the existing team because the existing team is having to mentor and teach them the ropes. Um, by the time the new staff gets rolling, the software they're building is now needing to integrate with the software from the original team. And this can be done, but it's more complex and requires extra care to get it right. And it actually slows down the delivery. 
All this adds up to us adding a lot more complexity risk and likely actually delivering less and not more valuable features by our by our date. Okay, but hypothetically though, there is a point where adding staff makes sense, right? You're just saying six months is too short of a time frame to have it make a difference. Yeah, that's right. I mean, every organization and product is different on where that inflection point is. But for us, I'd say unless you're looking at least eight months, I, I wouldn't consider adding staff to an existing project to get more features delivered. Okay. Uh, why don't we just incentivize the existing staff to work? Work hard, even willing to give them bonuses if they hit certain targets you set out. We could do mandatory overtime. Honestly, whatever is needed to get more out of them, we're willing to do. Yeah, I, I hear that. Uh, unfortunately, it won't work. What we're finding is we actually get less rather than the more uh, features delivered. Oh, yeah, now you're just being stuck. Well, what we were actually finding is from studies and our experience is that people that are overworked and tired, they make more mistakes. And then the cost to actually fix those mistakes is even much more expensive. Okay, that's in, it's interesting. So why don't we just cut quality? I hear the engineers occasionally talking about their automated tests, this new design idea, et cetera. Uh, lots of tech technical mumbo jumbo that doesn't add much value. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Um, actually, the technical mumbo jumbo is critical. And without it, your feature delivery will slow to a crawl. Automated testing, for example, that's what actually allows us to quickly adapt to change and ensure that any future changes don't change what we, what's been previously built. Um, the introduction of defects, it, it can be costly and potentially cause us to miss the deadline. So our goal is to build it right, you know, with that quality embedded into the product from the very beginning. Okay, so just to, just to summarize, so what you're saying is we can't add people, work the existing people more, or cut quality. So what can we do? Well, we have a few options. So the first one is that you could actually stop the project and look for another idea. So not all ideas are good ideas, and sometimes killing the project is the best and healthiest thing you can do. You have early information now that's telling you that this potentially is not a good idea. Um, it stops you from wasting time and money on an idea that will never deliver the results you want. Number two, we could push the date. I almost never recommend this. So fixed dates help us to focus on what's most important. Or three, we can cut the scope to fit the capacity that we do have. It's tough, but probably the healthiest and the most effective way to manage a, a, a you know a development project like this. So kill the project, change the date, cut scope. Those are my options. Right. So you said cutting scope is the healthiest way, uh, and we'd still have a product that delivers results. I look at all at all this stuff and it. It's all value. Yeah, that's that's true. So, um, the, since we have since our team is not burned out right now, they actually have a lot of energy and high level of mental capacity to help us innovate and come up with ideas to get the overall goal uh, by cutting or slicing details out of features. It will take collaboration with everyone to find ways to uh, and things to cut. But we should probably have a meeting and state clearly that our objective is to cut the overall product in half, um, which is about what we need to cut. Okay, that sense. Uh, just thinking though, what incentive does this give the team to work their hardest? I mean, if all we do is cut scope when things get tough, why would they work hard at all? That's a really good question. Well, since we're a team and we're all invested in accomplishing the goal, we're also part of the solution. We want this just as much as you do, Tim. And, you know, according to Daniel Pink, which is a great um, author that I, I really appreciate, he's proven that people are motivated by three things, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So when we have people with a purpose that they believe in, like this product we're building, and they have the freedom to accomplish it however they want, or they have that autonomy, and they're able to improve their capability, you know, that mastery of their, their, um, their discipline, we have a model for success. And so you have all those components in this particular product that you're going to have people being motivated to help you accomplish this goal. 
All right. That's interesting. I guess I, I guess it makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, one more thing before we wrap, um, we're going to want to do this frequently. So right now we need to cut scope. Tomorrow, we might want to add some critical features that just came up. The next day, we may want to learn that some things were harder or easier than we thought to build. The bottom line is that this isn't a static thing. It's a volatile, and to effectively manage this project, we have to collaborate frequently so that we're adjusting to the data and information quickly. Every day we wait just means one more day we're potentially building something we shouldn't or in a way that isn't optimal. Okay, no, that's, that sounds good. Let's go ahead and we'll meet weekly, have everyone in the meeting to review the data, cut or add features, and make whatever adjustments we need to work within the capacity we have. That sounds great. Um, yeah, I, I'd recommend that we use the time to show how well the team is working so you'll be able to see them in real life, how they're performing. And then we'll have them demonstrate the latest features that they just built for your feedback and from your teams. And then we'll collaborate together on the next priorities so that we're all aligned on what is the next big nugget that we need to tackle together. That's uh, That works for me. That sounds good. Let's, uh, okay. we'll, we'll get together next week. Okay, sounds good. We'll get it set up. All right, thanks. Thank you. So what we just saw there with that conversation with Tim and how Mike set it up is a fundamental change in the relationship on how we develop software. The engineers are promising to incrementally deliver high quality code and software that works. They're promising to operate in a way that enables effective forecasting, such as using time boxes or story points or other lightweight processes and practices. Management, or you could use the word customer or investor, is promising to continually prioritize, cut, and simplify business features to match the capacity of the team, and to collaborate constantly with the team to discover optimal solutions together. This enables some very important things. One, management can, at a moment's notice, change their mind. They can ask for new things or for things to be removed. They can go ahead and cancel the project completely or extend the project. Engineers can master their craft and perform at their very best and can solve problems how they feel they need to be solved. We've forgotten in many cases how agile changes this relationship between the management of the teams and the engineers are the people actually building the product. And so that is the second way in which we have lost our way. To get to the third, we'll complete our video or our, uh, our story here. Well, this thinks we won't get our inventory or shipping integration at all. I have to settle for text files. Yeah, but uh, you do get a secure portal for your customers and we can experiment with this idea. I guess. Uh, I'd like to get this app out into the pilot in the next month. Well, we still have four months till the official pilot and there's nothing built yet. Yeah, but in a month's time, there will be a basic registration and order process. It will be missing most of what we want, but enough will be there to do some basic flows. Could you help me understand the value in that? Why not just wait? Well, right now we think we have built something that works and that will make us money. I want to test all those assumptions and even the ones we don't acknowledge or realize we're making with this idea. Even just a beta group of five employees for one customer would be hugely valuable, I think, from a learning perspective. Okay, I can reach out to Tim and find us a customer and five beta employees to try this out. All right, thank you. Hey, Mike, I heard that beta group found something. Yeah, I'd say so. Well, we need to add an approval process. The customer started to get worried when they saw their employees buying so much. Yeah, and the engineers found a few issues too. First, a performance problem that they didn't expect. So before we build much more on top of this, they're going to fix that. Second thing we found was a strange bug with pens. It turns out no matter what you click on to order in production, it would register as a pen. 
Uh, they traced it down to some bad code, and that one's already fixed, actually. I guess you were right about testing our assumptions. Yep, you owe me. Hey, Mike, guess who Tim wants to pilot for this week? Who? Big Soda, 10,000 plus employees. Great. Wow, well, that's a pretty big risk, but I like being able to take it early. Let's see what we can learn. I know Tim has a pretty good relationship with Big, C big Soda's CEO, right? Yeah, and it turns out that the CEO of Big Soda is also friends with our number one shareholder. Tim thinks if we impress the CEO of Big Soda, we'll, the word will travel, won't have any problems with the shareholders for at least another six months. Wow, that's great. Good deal. Um, we'll get ready to launch then. Great. I, I know there's still several items on the backlog, but for first release, you guys have done nearly everything we've needed. I also haven't heard or seen a single bug with uh, this since the initial beta group. That's how we do it. <laughs> Mike, you did it. You did the impossible. No, we did it. Your partnership in figuring out what needed to change, what scope to cut, what to prioritize first, it was also critical to our success. Yeah, but your engineers came up with some amazing ways to simplify things. I mean, they were the ones who said, just dump the orders to a text file and hire staff to enter those manually. Yeah, they're really good. And oh, by the way, they're also currently working on the shipping integration. So that should be done in about a week. That's so awesome. I have to say, I'm not used to the stuff you guys built operating so smoothly. I mean, I haven't heard a lick of complaints from users about bugs, slowness, anything like that. Yeah, well, you can see how valuable it will be for us to keep the team together, right? Mm -hmm. And it turns out, uh, you know, that definition of done that we built at the beginning, it really does mean done. Good stuff. That's awesome. I, I think we're about to get some relief on our budget pressures. So we get to talk about our next idea. All right, let's chat. I look forward to it. Awesome. All right. So the third, or I should say, the number one way in which we've lost our way is we have forgotten the works of Kent Beck, the early movers and shakers in the agile movement. They emphasized a different set of skills, a different set of technical practices that were required in order to do agile development. The old ways of writing code wouldn't work with the new way, with the agile way. Developing software iteratively that works and then being able to change or build upon that and add new features quickly, release it quickly. These are all new disciplines and requires unlearning of some things that as an industry we learned with Waterfall. The practices of XP, design principles and more are not optional. It is specifically called out in Agile principle number nine it says specifically that technical excellence and good design enhances agility. To rephrase in a little bit slightly different way, the lack of technical excellence in bad design kills agility. Agile principle one, two, seven, eight, and 12 require high technical excellence in order to be able to achieve them. Why have we lost our technical practices? Well, this actually goes right back to the early days in the Battle of the Frameworks. XP was the original dominant framework in the industry, which emphasized the technical disciplines. Scrum, for a variety of factors, went ahead and won that battle. And now Scrum is the predominant framework. Scrum or Kanban today, you could say. But those approaches, Scrum, Kanban, do not come with a set of technical practices of this is how we develop software. They are more on the project management side of agility. And Jeff Sutherland himself noted this, saying that in order to do Scrum effectively in software development, 
you need the technical disciplines. You need these practices in order to achieve that hyperproductive state for which Scrum was designed. And so that's the number one way we've lost our way, is we've forgotten that technical excellence and good design are not optional, they're required. But all three of these actually have an interesting relationship between each other in what we see today. And this is what I call the agile journey to waterfall. And it goes a little bit like this. Lack of technical excellence in good design leads to poor quality in defects, which damages the team's sustainable pace and predictability, which then produces really erratic data and forecasting, which leads to management disillusionment and failures of projects for no good reason other than we just failed to execute well. Then we get questions like, why aren't we getting results? And then you get comments from leadership, get a hold of your people, Mike. And then cries for, we need a better way. Which then leads to management, you know, and a response from, you know, from us as agile, uh, for agilists is, well, management's all going back to their to their old command and control structures. I mean, listen to them. They're telling us, get a hold of our people. What we need is more agile. So we need more agile processes. We need more constructs. We need more things. And we end up with lots of process and constructs, all in the name of agile. We could just rename it waterfall. And as Kent Beck said, we're right back to where we were 20 years ago. How do we find our way back? How do we end on a happy note here? Well, it's actually quite simple. It's hard, but it's simple. Engineers need to step up and become leaders in the agile movement. We need more engineers. We need more of the technical practices. We need to refocus on our roots of technical excellence and good design in order to achieve the results that agile promises. We then, are going to be able to use that improved delivery and quality to repair and reset our relationships with management. And then finally, we are going to be able to solve that original problem that we set out to solve in the very beginning, how to deliver projects on time and on budget. And that's my talk, thank you. Awesome talk, Mike. <laughs>